I don't think a lot of people realize how much goes into the planning and development of a vineyard. And I look at Sauvignon Blanc, too, is it can be very transparent of the farming style. A lot of people don't realize Sonoma County is a million acres. It makes us about the size of Rhode Island as a state. For most people who are really into wine, being a wine dude, a wine nut, or whatever you want to call it, I think they all have a wet dream to make their own wine eventually. I really had fun with doing my job, with doing wine, with being a viticulturist. You know, to stay out of the vineyard, I only have the shotgun for the boar, and I'm thinking, great. As much as I love Chardonnay, I didn't want to spend my nights worrying about it and my days talking about it. I worked 14 hours the day before I went into labor. I was determined to get most of that Chardonnay in. In another beautiful, sunny day in Napa Valley, in a room full of half crazy, half passionate people. I mean, how, how, how bad could it be? We say, so drink the wine. That's kind of our motto here at Life Between the Vines. One of the cool things about wine, besides drinking it, is the people you drink it with. And the stories you hear and tell with wine all come together to make every bottle unique. Discovering and tasting wine shouldn't be a homework assignment. And we believe that the people who are closest to wine have the best stories. So open a bottle. And welcome to podcast number 199. This week we feature Tom Gamble of Gamble Family Vineyards in Napa Valley. Tom Gamble is a Napa Valley farmer with a family history of farming celebrating 100 years. Tom, easily recognizable in his classic cowboy hat, is all about the dirt. And when it comes to wine, Tom gets to work with some mighty fine dirt. We visited with Tom during Auction Napa Valley back in June, so if you get a chance, watch our barrel auction video on YouTube and see if you can pick them out. I'm here with Tom Gamble of Gamble Family Vineyards here in uh, Oakville, I believe, right? We are in Oakville. All right. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing great. It's the morning after the barrel auction. I know you can hear your voice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, we had a good time. <laughs> it was a great day yesterday. I don't know what the money's shaking out to be at this point from the barrel auction, but uh, it seemed to be moving along pretty good. I have no idea. I was just busy uh, tasting other people's wines and making sure people got to taste ours. That's the best part, isn't it? <laughs> it is. That's, uh, I guess, why we do this. I guess so, yeah. Well, we have a lot to talk about today. And one of the things I find most fascinating about Napa Valley is families like yours who have been here for a good period of time. How long has your family been here? We're celebrating our 100th year this year. That's a pretty long time. It is. Um, I, I'm, it's a cause for celebration and probably a sanity check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, winemaking isn't always a great business plan, is it? It can be, but we started off on the farming side, and winemaking is the newest venture. Uh, the previous, uh, I'm third generation, and the previous two acquired land and farmed and kept the land in the family. After, as you can imagine, there's economic uh, turbulence over the course of 100 years. And uh, so it's, it's been my task and honor to start a wine label. Was the family from California? Did they come here from somewhere? My grandfather and his, uh, his father, uh, when my grandfather was a little boy, my great-grandfather brought him from Kentucky. And they moved to the South Bay because uh, my, my great-grandfather wanted his kids to have an enlightened education at this new school called Stanford. Mm. And, um, but my grandfather rebelled and he went to Davis. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And then he followed his older brother uh, to Napa and uh, was, uh, started his, his ventures in uh, 1916. So when the farming began, was, I'm assuming it was great farming. It wasn't. Oh, okay. It was about anything uh, but. Uh, in 1916, prohibition was already being discussed and bandied about. It, it didn't seem like a good career move for a young man. So he got into uh, livestock, which I think was his passion, and he did quite well with in, in those eras. But he also had pears and tomatoes and whatever he thought he could make money uh, growing or, or producing. Mm-hmm. The typical farmer story. Sure. And then Prohibition came along, which didn't have any great effect on you, which was, thank God. Right. And he was able to uh, uh, save his money and be very frugal and, and start acquiring land as other people were hurt by Prohibition. 
I can't even imagine, especially here. It, it was tough on everybody. Even uh, even the sheriff was arrested for bootlegging <laughs> by the feds. I'd never heard that before. Right. Well, if you got to be a sheriff arrested for bootlegging, <laughs> being a sheriff in Napa Valley, why not? Right. You start thinking of Dukes of Hazard or something. Yeah, back roads the whole bit, you know? That's right. Shooting up between Silverado and 29. So... When, when did the idea of planting vineyards come along? The, the writing was on the wall. Uh, when my grandfather passed, he had all this land, but he only had two acres of grapes. And uh, the writing was on the wall that that was the agricultural trend. And so uh, when he passed and uh, we went through all the uh, trials and tribulations of estate planning and trying to save what land we could from uh, death taxes, uh, we leased out uh, the legacy property to to Behringer and uh, Walt and Roy Raymond were still involved at the time, and uh, it's been with Behringer since those early days in the seventies. Oh wow! So and then my career has been to uh, acquire vineyards and farm it, and then add the wine business. When did that all? When did you you know start your part here? Um, I started farming um, in the very early 80s while I was still going to Davis Legacy. And with other partners, we had our first vineyard, which was actually a hops field, and uh, it got converted to uh, vineyards, uh, which is why I was on the six-year program and Tuesday, Thursday classes. (laughs) Nice. Oh, you got through it. We got through it, but uh, we can remember starting at 8% and going to 13% uh, before there was any income coming off. So... It was uh, definitely uh, got a little down in the heels uh, there for a while, but we made it all work, and you're young, and you can sleep in the back of the pickup and work, wake up without any creaks in your back. And so, but we made it work, and it was fun. So were you a wine lover before you got into the idea of farming? Yeah, I was. Um, uh, I think there are, are two parallel paths of why I have a winery. One is the love of the land and wanting to uh, build upon uh, the legacy that is my family history. And then, of course, uh, loving wine. And I I was a neophyte, definitely, when I started um, growing grapes. And uh, I think, unconsciously, my palate was formed by having lots of friends and their parents in the wine industry and tasting uh, vintages, uh, perhaps surreptitiously, from some great sellers in the Napa Valley when you're a teenage kid and tasting uh, from the 60s and 70s particularly, uh, an era when our wines were made in a different style. I think that's uh, kind of the odd disadvantage growing up in Napa Valley because you're really tasting kind of the best of the best. Um, I don't think it's a disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I mean, it's funny, how do, you, how do you taste anything else sometimes? I mean, it's not even a matter of a house palate. It's just this idea of really being around some amazing wines. It is. I can. I, I remember, uh, the, and the wines were made differently. One, because our viticultural techniques are not what they are today. And uh, there wasn't the kind of money in, in, in the wine business then. And so wines were made uh, differently. I think that there was probably even a greater spread of varietal, uh, of vintage uh, variability because of we had a lot of virus vines and it wasn't really until Mr. Mondavi uh, would pay on the come for uh, grapes that would incentivize uh, growers to use better farming techniques because they could afford to. That allowed uh, winemaking to take the next leap forward. And it seems like a leapfrog uh, process. Winemaking reaches a level then it incentivizes uh, growers to uh, up their game and then that allows wine to become uh, even better and and so on and so forth. So about how many acres are you farming here? About 170 uh, that my wife and I have built up over the years. And that's planted? Uh, Or being replanted. Wow, yeah. We got a lot of replanting going on right now. Percentage-wise, roughly? About half. Wow. Yeah. Well, there's another interesting business plan right there. Ten-year time horizons minimum. Yeah, I was say you're not ready. You're not really going anywhere right now. Uh, <laughs> no, I have. Uh, you know, when you're on probation, you have to wear those ankle bracelets. <laughs> I think the bank has one on me. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. <laughs> was it disease, Laos? 
age mostly, and we still sell most of our grapes, and um, an ever-increasing percentage are coming into our project, but on an acreage basis, uh, we have a very small uh, percentage of it coming into our wine business. If we were fully planted, I would say it's probably 10 to 20%. Okay, yeah. That's always amazing when, you know, people like me, wine drinkers here, that's like, wow, you got all that grape, all that juice. But depending on how much wine you're making. Right. It's a business that you want to try to grow organically versus uh, taking out full-time, full-page ads here and there. And uh, plus, I can't afford full-page ads. And that's why talking to folks like you is so great. Get the word out. But we're, we're just trying to build something that's sustainable in the broadest sense of the word. So there's something for the next generation. And we're taking care of the planet, the people, and you have to have some profits. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, this is a part of, I don't want to get into it at all, but this idea of, you know, can't afford and, and the money that involves it, you know, people have this very different image of Napa Valley, certainly than I do, that, you know, this is any other business with the exception of the extreme timelines involved with things. Right. It takes money, it a takes, lot of money. It takes a lot of capital yeah. and it takes a solid operating line for a lot of folks. And it's like any other capital intensive business. And young folks, it's tough to have anything other than a virtual brand. And we didn't build this winery to begin with. Uh, We started off with uh, a couple hundred cases and uh, renting space to make the wine. And we wanted to make sure that we had a shot at building a sustainable business before we invested this capital. And uh, so far, so good. Nice. When did you start making wine? The Gamble uh, label started with the 2005 vintage. So I guess this will be 11 years this year. And I, I, I was in a partnership before that, so I could learn a little bit about the wine business side of things. I had worked in wineries and as a seller rat and things like that, but I didn't really know much about sales and marketing and all of that. I certainly knew something about farming. And that's kind of the funny thing about this. So many layers. Where you're talking yeah. about you're you know, you're you're farming for other people, you're you have grapes that you're selling off or, or juice you're selling off, you're making your own, then you're in an office, then you're selling the grapes and you have a tasting room. That's a lot of stuff. It is. Uh, thank God for that week between Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even talk about compliance. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is interesting. There's a definite season, probably if you're on one side of the business or another where it slows down, but when you're in an entrepreneurial phase of your life and you're a small but vertically integrated outfit, if you're not farming and if you're not winemaking or you're not in your office doing something, then you're selling. And uh, I think I like doing everything except the office work. I think a lot of people share that. <laughs> can't do the office work outside papers blow all over the place Uh, well that's right but i am becoming as addicted to an ipad and and paperless as possible but dust and ipads are that well let's just say uh they become a disposable item (laughs) yes and you don't want them to do that really Uh, not too often so i hate to go for the obvious but i can't help it you know when you got the name gamble which Uh is your family i'm Mm -hmm. sure a lot of people thinking oh that was your concept in opening winery you were taking a gamble well don't don't take a gamble drink gamble (laughs) (laughs) nice well done we'll use that thanks but i mean it's kind of an irony of course it's a little bit like you know this is exactly what it's all about but in the end it's a family vineyard it's a family business it is and uh, the wine side of it is really structured to uh, benefit the next generation and and hopefully generations uh, beyond that and there's still um, the oldest one is uh, a junior in college and the youngest one is in the third grade so um, uh, so the nieces and nephews are there's uh, a a dozen of them I think and um, lose track sometimes a lot of them are are, are doing summer uh, work here and or after school work so it's cool to see and it's it's cool to see how each kid has a different strength and what they gravitate towards do you think that they're getting a taste for i mean obviously we're not talking to third grader here but you know a taste for what might be their future yes and no names but you know which one you are <laughs> Telling the seller workers that you're going to be their boss someday. You're a little young to be doing that, and you're going to have to get beat up by life a lot before that happens. <laughs> nice. We could send you that back if you like, and you could Please use that. Please do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be great. That's one way to get their attention. <laughs> wow. 
So now that you've been doing this 11 years, have you been involved with the NVV the entire time? or Yes, to one degree or another. Talk about a great trade organization, and not only for protecting the image of Napa and working on land use issues and the Appalachian Napa and trying to keep that as cohesive and protecting it from you know, nefarious use around the world that doesn't have the rule of law all the time. It's great. And then, of course, the way that the vintners come together to give back to the community is pretty astounding. And, you know, the high teen, millions of teens of dollars, $17 million or $16 million, amazing for a small community that has, uh, I think, less than 150,000 people living in it. All right, we're not talking about a big city here. No, we're not. And, uh, well, if it was a big city, we we wouldn't have big vineyards. <laughs> yeah. And Or little vineyards. It would uh, probably look like uh, the, the South Bay. It'd be sprawl. It would be sprawl or gated communities. Yeah, that would be sad. Very sad. It would. The folks who were around in the 50s and 60s, it was extremely visionary to push back on the regional government that was saying we were going to have a million people in the valley by 1980. And all the ag preserve legislation, which is controversial even to this day amongst some in the community, and even the winery definition ordinance, it's all meant to keep the beautiful scenery you see and attempt to keep agriculture viable. Well, one thing about winemakers is uh, you guys have your opinions. (laughs) Oh, we do, and it's uh, when to pick the grapes all the way to, uh, I, I, I don't know, how many uh, people should be allowed to come to a tasting. And then uh, you can smooth ruffle, ruffle feathers uh, with a glass of wine. That's kind of the cool thing about it. You know, again, at heart, all of you, or 90% of you are farmers, and that spirit of helping each other out always amazes me. I love to be able to let our listeners understand how you guys are willing to help each other out. Well, there, there's a lot of that. We were, uh, I, I was mentioning how we're redeveloping a piece of the family home, and the neighbor has a, a little hydraulic lift a dump that you can pull behind a tractor that you can throw the rocks into. He's letting us borrow that. Well, it's rent, but it's uh, not market rate. Let's just put it that way. Maybe we'll barter for some wine. It's so, not, a, bit, it's not a, a bad idea. It's, it's not a bad idea. I mean, world peace over a glass of wine. That's the way we're going to get there. <laughs> That's a good motto. I like that idea. Yeah. 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 Actually, we'd probably get a lot but along much better if we had that particular concept. There was an interesting article uh, just this past week I, somewhere that I read about how the Supreme Court justices keep on speaking terms over good food and good wine. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even begin to imagine what that will be like. Oh, good God. Yeah, probably a higher caliber intellectual col- conversation than I could handle. Yeah, I think the average people would just fall off. <laughs> yeah, they would just go for the wine. Yeah. <laughs> Got to go. Oh, look, shiny object. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For all this time you've been doing this, I mean, you've got to have some great stories, funny, crazy, maybe even frightening, you know, anything that maybe comes to mind. Of course, I am putting you on the spot, but that's my job. Yeah. So let's see what's internet appropriate. Um, we, we have to comply with OSHA and uh, we have a, a very rigorous a uh, uh, worker safety program and there are refresher courses every year our our harvest interns will begin to start uh, in June here uh, in another two weeks or so and uh, and and then come on full stream over the next uh, 45 days and they will have to go through all kinds of processes and take a few tests just to make sure that they absorb what they have to say and um, get outfitted for their masks uh, that uh, they, they would have to wear if they go inside a tank or or are dealing with sulfur or something like that. Now a lot of serious stuff. It is and it's all good and really you're, you're thinking about uh, the long hours that one works during harvest and that's and we've all been fatigued before doing this or that and that's usually when the mistakes happen. And when you have a forklift or a ladder or a punch down device or something like that and moving parts that separate grapes from stems and things like that, you want to make sure all the uh, safety procedures are followed. Um, as far as the wines, uh, I see what we have on the table and I want to just talk about what you're making here. What kind of varietals? Um, we make, uh, we're focused on the Bordeaux varieties and uh, we have a, little, a few side passion projects that are available only here at the winery. but. We, we have kind of a unique approach to the way we're developing our wine business. And uh, we're making wines that are exclusively sold here at the winery and, and to our members. And 
And then we make wines that are exclusively available to uh, wine shops and, and, and restaurants. And the needs of both are different. And we're f- going to focus on a couple of wines today. Well, and, and we have one hybrid wine, uh, the Paramount, that uh, we'll try here. That's our Bordeaux-style blend, so it's sold both here and in restaurants. Napa is known mainly for its reds, but I started with a Sauvignon Blanc off of what I call the Gamble Vineyard, and it's where I live, about a mile from here in, in Yonville, on the east side of the uh, Yonville Hill, sandwiched between the Napa River and, and Con Creek, our little entre de mer region, as I call it. So the Sauvignon Blanc uh, was the first thing we came to market with. It, it has had some accolades, and uh, are we going to pour? Oh, well, if you would like to, I would love to, yes. Yeah. To me, uh, the, way, the way we approach all of our wine, grape growing and winemaking is to pick on multiple dates. Just like uh, I, I often use the gross analogy of, uh, it doesn't mean to gross you out, but a broad analogy of that, that green banana on your windowsill, and it tastes different every day as it ripens. And it's the same in the vineyard. Um, the grapes will be subtly to overtly different in any given time. So we picked the 2015 harvest over 21 different days. And wow. it's uh, a combination of uh, Muscain and what we call uh, the Preston clone. And it has a weird number that the nurseries give it, but it's in honor of Lou Preston, who first brought the clone over from France uh, back in the early days of the 60s. I fell in love with Sauvignon Blanc when I got to uh, go to France and taste some great white Bordeaux's and particularly some uh, Loire's. And it didn't taste like that crummy cash flow stuff uh, my date would order at Happy Steak uh, during college or something like that. (laughs) So I was blown away by it when I bought this piece of property and felt that it had the perfect terroir for what I was going to do with Sauvignon Blanc. So a few different clones in it, uh, the Muscat and the Preston clone, and the different harvest dates. It's a barrel ferment, uh, neutral oak barrels. There might be one or two new ones in there, but it's neutral oak uh, just to uh, allow it to have a little more oxygen, slowly get into it and, and soften the mouthfeel versus an inert vessel like a stainless steel tank. It overwinters in those barrels, and then we blend all those different barrels together, and we have a wide melange of, of barrels. Uh, there, there could be up to different 20 different barrel types, and mostly neutral oak, as I mentioned. Or maybe I didn't. Well, cheers. Cheers. And uh, I get, by picking at different ripenesses, you get different acid levels. So there's enough buoyancy and zest from the early picks to keep it elevated on the palate. And you might get some Meyer lemon. Uh, sometimes I also think it, there's a, a little bit of a lemon meringue sort of thing going on in there. And then it, it'll go up and get other perhaps citrus flavors and then also maybe some nectarine and perhaps as it warms up and evolves, perhaps some guava and more tropical fruit flavors. What does this sell for? This is about 25 bucks that you might find it on a shelf uh, fully marked up. It has a big brother we sell here at the winery and that's um, 80 bucks and we don't want to burden our uh, restaurants with an $80 uh, bottle of Sauvignon Blanc. And, but we have plenty of fans for it here, and we do quite well by, by it. But this Sauvignon Blanc, it is what is probably most open on our kitchen table at home every evening. Uh, my wife likes it quite a bit, and we had that 103-degree day yesterday, and it's a real porch pounder on a day like that. Uh, You've got to be careful and hydrate every once in a while. Right, that's true. It's really, really nice. Boy, that lemon does really come out. Without being too green or tart, so... If, if you have lemongrass and, and grassy uh, at one extreme and pineapple on the other, we try to come off, that, off the edges of those continuum, that continuum and hit that broad middle range from citrus to uh, stone fruit, I would say. We had a light crop last year, and so it's usually 50-50 between Muscat and the Preston clone, which it has its origins in, in Bordeaux. And it's usually about 50-50, and we're a little heavier because of the vintage variation on the Muscat clone this past year. 15, obviously, was an interesting year. I mean, at this point, do you have any gut feeling? What you're, I mean, I realize we're really early here, but... Leading up to 15, we had... 12, 13, and 14, were, which were all three cro- years were abundant crops of high quality. 
the 15 was a very shy crop. It, it, it's almost how many how many uh, teams go to the Super Bowl three years in a row and then go a fourth year and win. They're tired, and, and the Vines get a little tired, I think, and they need to rest and uh, regain their strength. So we had a fairly light crop. It was also because we had almost a 2011 sort of May and the rest of the growing season was almost idyllic, but in May we had some kind of wet and damp uh, and cool weather that affected the set. We would have had a lot of crop anyway, but the quality is another outstanding year that um, even the JV team can make good wine out of. <laughs> nice. So we're very fortunate in, in Napa. Um, all the great wine regions around the world, we may have some of the most idyllic climate. Burgundy is obviously a ch- very challenging. Bordeaux has more weather variation than we do and so on and so forth. Uh, we seem to really be in a sweet spot. Yeah, it's a very, I don't want to use the word lucky, but just seems to be everything, every element you'd want. It falls into that. Wow. It, it, it does, and it's a small area. We're only one-eighth the size of Bordeaux and one-third the size of Sonoma. You can explore from Carneros to Calistoga on the valley floor, and you can go up into the hills on each side of the valley. We are just beginning to tease apart all the microclimates, even on the valley floor. Yeah, it's amazing. North Oakville, South Oakville, sure. East Oakville, West. Yeah. All right. So the next one we're going to try is uh, the Paramount. And it's called Paramount because we got drunk and came up with a name. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a little uh, more complicated than that, but not much. And we, at, at the time we started, we had another uh, Bordeaux-style blend, and this was to Paramount was uh, supposed to indicate our, our best uh, blend. Uh, the other blend has since gone away, and we just have Paramount. The goal is to have a Bordeaux-style blend that's about a third, a third, a third every year of Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, with a little room left over for uh, some Petit Verdot. And it's never perfect. And, oh, when we have blends, the percentages are always on the back label. So the Cabernet Sauvignon Blanc was exactly 33%, 32 on the Franc. Merlot was 30% this year and 5% mm. Petit Verdot. I, I would call this classically structured, elegant Napa fruit and long-lived. The biggest deviation I think we've had from the, that rough blend is in 2011, a uh, challenging vintage, but it, was, it worked out really well for us to uh, go up into the 40s with the Cabernet because in our particular vineyards, the Cabernet did better than the Franc and the, and the Merlot. Hmm. That vintage was, to me, a very profound vintage and one that was extremely age-worthy, a little less up front because of the coolness. And um, it also, I think people are, it got a bit of a bad rap in the press, but I think over time, it's going to be like, I don't know, uh, 98 or something like that. People come back and say, wow, we really blew it on, on judging that vintage. I totally agree with that. It's much maligned. Your uh, total output again is how many cases? We make about 2,000 cases for uh, our, our members, and we make probably about three to 4,000 cases uh, right now for the restaurants and the wine shops. Now, just because I'm sort of a geek, no, I am a geek, I assume you keep a reasonable library of what you've made. We do. I think in our earliest vintages, we probably didn't keep as much as uh, we should have, but that was more about, <laughs> I need the money, man. But now we do, and we have we have a spreadsheet, and we actually decide how much to keep. And we have two libraries. We have a, a, a technical library that only Jim Close, my winemaker, and I, and parenthetically, Jim has made every bottle of Gamble over those years. So we have our own stash mm. uh, for technical tastings. <laughs> and research. <laughs> research. <laughs> right. And uh, then we have one that will, as our members come back to us and say, I really like that. We, we finally opened it, and uh, I'd love to buy more, and we're able to satisfy them. But since we're aging it, it costs more, so buy it current. This is the whole idea of how much you can keep and, and how right. much you can end up selling has always mm-hmm. been something that baffles me because, gosh, it's got to suck when you get down to the end of it. And then do you sort of put a lid on it saying, okay, we've got 10, 15, 5 cases, whatever it might be. We're not going to sell any more of this. We do want to see where this is going to go other than the technical wine. Well, again, we were talking about uh, long time frames, and this falls into that category. And it becomes easier to hold back wine as you have 
succeeding vintages to go into. We may particularly like one vintage over another or or think that it needs more bottle aging. And so we may hold, because we think there's going to be a great surprise at the end. And so we may hold back a little more than that. But we always have that spreadsheet and a certain number that we're going to hit. And I don't think we ever go under it. And uh, but we'll certainly maybe hold back a bit more if we think there's there's an opportunity there to re-release it, not only for a little more money, but because it's going to taste a whole lot better. Yeah, totally different. Uh, what is uh, what is the uh, Paramount sell for? Uh, the Paramount is uh, a ninety dollar bottle of wine here at the winery, and you'll often find it on the shelves for say eighty bucks, seventy five bucks. It, on a, on a restaurant list, it'll be uh, over a hundred usually. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. We're here, obviously, today at the tasting room. Yeah. And uh, I'm assuming anybody who wants to come by and visit you would do that by appointment, I would think, especially considering... We're very small, and we want to... I, I mentioned uh, the idea of exclusivity, and it's not to be exclusive in a snobby way, but it's meant to be exclusive so everybody who comes here can have a personal experience. And uh, as you can see, we have two little uh, salons that we use. And in fact, I think I'm supposed to use that word, not tasting room. Mm. Sorry, talking points, people. But so, yes, but uh, you can go to our website and call us. I have a great team of folks who will take care of you. They'll let you know the drill and uh, give us as, as much advanced warning as possible. And that's what I was coming to for our listeners who would like to learn a little bit about Tom Gamble of Gamble Family Vineyards. How would they do that online? What is your website? GambleFamilyVineyards.com. We have a, thank God it's here on the back of the label because I don't have it memorized. <laughs> we have a toll-free number as well. It's one 661 9111 one 661 Nine triple one. You have a career on TV, Tom. <laughs> you know how to work the camera. Tom, this has been great. I do appreciate you taking the time. It was a lot of fun meeting you yesterday before this because it really. It was like warm up. Exactly. All right. Well, cheers. Cheers to you, sir. Thank you. Learn more by visiting gamblefamilyvineyards.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to like us on Facebook. Also, check out our YouTube channel. Life Between the Vines is produced at Fifth Floor Recording Company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Produced and edited by Ray Fister. Theme song and original music written and recorded by Tim Dondarevo. Our host is Kay Paskoff. Web design by Jenny Holland. Our graphics and website specialist is Lawton Hall. Our intern is Eden Herbert. Our web geek is Dan Gieschen. Photos by Jeanette Herniak. Copyright 2016.